That South Carolina police officer now charged with murder and that driver in the moments before the deadly shooting. In South Carolina, white former police officer was sentenced today to 20 years in federal prison in the fatal shooting of an unarmed black man. 36-year-old Michael Slager pleaded guilty to violating the civil rights of 50-year-old Walter Scott. A state murder trial ended in a hung jury. Um, I'm going to be I'm going to be totally honest with you. Do that. I am. And give me just a second. The honesty comes from my heart. Um, I, I have watched the video um, and, and I was sickened by what I saw. Stop. Zoom out. Uh huh. And again. Zoom right on out, away from the fear, the pain, and the fury. Away from the wanton violence, the tribalized after judgments, the social divisions. Let's zoom so far out that we can walk outside and along the perimeter of immediate things until the heat and anger and passions become muffled in the distance. Now let's turn back around for a second and sit down for a spell in this quieter place, peering back at the people left behind, living and dead. Let us be silent wolves on a wooded hilltop, eyes intent on the flickering campfires scattered along the bottom of the valley far below. There. From up here, we can see the entrance to the long, steep-sided valley. We can smell the wet dust in the heavy storm clouds gathering over and beyond the ridge opposite. We can see how the men below must have followed the same river winding along the valley floor, and how they pitched camp too low in the bottomlands, their flimsy tents set right down in the path of the flash floods so common in this valley called the American South. What were the names of the men again? Walter Scott, Michael Slager, and Eddie Driggers. Walter L. Scott, the man shot dead, bearer of a surname with perhaps only a tangential connection to his deep ancestry, like so many African Americans. Michael Slager, the policeman who shot Walter Scott dead, now in prison. His surname probably an American corruption of a German name carried to these shores. Schläger. Multiple meanings in German. Beater. Striker. Ruffian. And police chief, Eddie Driggers. Driggers. Now that's an unusual surname. And to understand the story of this name, we will need to zoom out even farther and attempt to see not just far and wide, but past and present. I'm Brian Halpin. Welcome to the time before we were white. Joao had a gift for languages. This is no rarity in ethnically mixed families, and certainly not uncommon in places which have always been at a trade crossroads, places like the Caribbean. Joao was born in the late 1500s in Santo Domingo, the son of a Portuguese sailor and an African mother. History is silent on the details of their meeting. Was this African woman freeborn? Was she a lover? A wife? A consort? A prostitute? 
did this sailor meet Joao's mother in Santo Domingo? Or did he bring her there from a distant Portuguese trading post in Angola or Madagascar? We can only speculate. Joao would almost certainly have spoken not only Portuguese, but also Spanish, along with his mother's African tongue, as well as the Creole spoken on the island of Hispaniola. Joao would have also encountered the voices of English, Dutch, and French pirates and privateers who prowled these waters with hungry eyes, lavishly spending their silver in the shops, taverns, and brothels of Santo Domingo. One day, perhaps in late 1612, a Dutch sea captain called Thijs Vulcan's Mossel dropped anchor in the Caribbean to purchase provisions for his small merchant ship, the Young Tobias. Mossel was probably hoping to catch the easterly Christmas winds which might carry his ship far to the north, where other Dutch traders had recently heard rumours of a potentially lucrative trade in furs, especially beaver, which had become scarce as gold in Europe and was highly prized by the wealthy merchant classes there. We do not know how Mossel came into contact with Joao. What we do know is that Mossel was impressed enough with the man to offer him a position aboard the young Tobias as his personal trade interpreter. Two and a half thousand kilometers is a long journey, especially by the Atlantic Sea. During the Age of Sail, Traveling two and a half thousand kilometers was more than just a long journey. Two and a half thousand kilometers was an adventure, an epic endeavor fraught with risk and danger. So while we know little about their various inner motivations, there can be no doubting the courage and daring of Joao or of Mossel and his crew. The young Tobias safely reached the land of the Wappinger and Munsi peoples in early 1613. Thijs and its new interpreter would need to work fast. Another Dutch trader operating out of Amsterdam by the name of Hendrik Christensen had already reconnoitered this area over the past 24 months and was in the middle of attempting to set up his own trading post on a river island abandoned by earlier French fur traders. Luckily for Thijs, his decision to hire Joao turned out to be a very canny decision. The Afro-Portuguese man soon befriended the local people, spending much of 1613 among them, learning their Algonquian tongue. This friendship was more than mere business expediency. Trust between the two parties was such that Joao had soon taken a wife from among their people. Joao offered the Munsi and Wappinger what seemed to have been fair trading terms, simultaneously managing to undercut the terms being offered at the time by Hendrik Christiansen and his partner, Adrian Bloch. Thijs Mossel soon departed once more for the Netherlands to purchase more exchangeable goods, while Joao elected to stay behind with a small inventory of ironmongery for his new trading post. Sometimes we simply have to read between the lines when trying to understand distant events with meagre primary historical sources. But these things seem clear. 1. Hendrik Christiansen's partner Adrian Bloch wrote back to Amsterdam absolutely livid about Joao's success among the Indians, a success seemingly built on mutual respect and reasonable trade terms. 2. Within six years, Bloch's partner Hendrik Christiansen would be dead at the hands of these same local Indians. And three, unlike many other settlement attempts in North America in the days before Plymouth Colony, such as the one at Roanoke, Virginia, the trading outpost established by Zhao survived and thrived. A few short years following the death of Hendrik Christiansen, the Netherlands decided to invest heavily in the trade outposts established by men like Mossel and Joao. Joao's trading post lay within the territory of his wife's Lenap people on a small, sparsely populated island which would later be established as the central hub of colonial New Amsterdam. An island known today 
as Manhattan. Yes, that Manhattan. Manhattan, New York. One thing we haven't mentioned yet is Joao's full name. Joao Rodriguez. Called Juan by the Spanish and Jan by the Dutch. The fact that one of the oldest, greatest cities in North America was founded in large part by a Portuguese Afro-Caribbean man is a fascinating little-known piece of American history. But perhaps even more intriguing is the fact that long, long before the USA's annexation of the Spanish Southwest centuries later, the surname Rodriguez was already being handed down the generations back east and being put through the washer and wringer of white Anglo-cultural ascendancy, until eventually becoming almost entirely unrecognizable as a Latino surname at all. But this old, old East Coast colonial era name is still with us, albeit in a much changed form. Driggers. There is no reason, or even any need, to assume a direct connection between people named Driggers in South Carolina today and Joao Rodriguez of Manhattan. Joao disappeared into the fog of early New Amsterdam history, and we do not know which, if any, of his multi-ethnic family's descendants are still with us today. But you see, Rodriguez was not an uncommon surname anywhere in the world in 1600, never mind early colonial America. At the time of the founding of the Jamestown and Plymouth colonies, the Spanish and Portuguese had already been planting trade colonies around the world for nearly 120 years. Trying to pin down one specific man named Rodriguez in the Spanish-Portuguese Empire would be like hunting for a specific John Smith in the English-speaking world of the 18th century. A much abridged list of only Portuguese colonial settlements predating Jamestown and Plymouth would include Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritania, Mozambique, Barbados, Santo Domingo, Macau, the Azor Islands, the Cape Verde Islands, Madeira, Sao Tome and Principe, Bombahia, otherwise known as Bombay, Chittagong, Cochin, Diu, Goa, Calicut, Calcutta, the Maldive Islands, Sri Lanka, once called Ceylon, Japan, Bahrain, Brazil, Indonesia, Java, Malacca, Malaysia, East Timor. You get the picture. Now, try to imagine the number of Portuguese people named Rodriguez born in all of those places. Then try to imagine the number of people of indigenous or mixed ethnicity born in all of those places. People also bearing the surname Rodriguez due to blood, or to bureaucratic insistence that colonized people relinquish their native names. We don't even need to imagine, really. When it comes to America, much of this is written down in black and white. Early colonial archives in Virginia and the Carolinas hold many, many records of people named Rodriguez or its English variant, Driggers. A surname usually connected to free people of color from those precious early decades before slavery became inextricably linked to skin color in law. Eventually, these free people of color in early America would have to make some serious life choices as ever stricter race laws closed around them like a boa constrictor. Some would descend into poverty, ostracized by white society. Some would head west to the frontier, 
where the law was looser. Still others would marry white whenever possible until the passing generations made their skin less noticeable to a malevolent social order. Parents and grandparents might repeat lies or simply maintain a stony silence until later generations were born not even knowing where they came from, until the lies were no longer needed and self-loathing withered away under the blanket of amnesia. Now let's zoom back in a bit. Charleston, South Carolina, 2015. Walter L. Scott, Michael Slager, Eddie Driggers. Just three men. From a distant height, we saw all of them enter the long, steep-sided valley. We saw the heavy storm clouds gathering over and beyond the ridge opposite. We saw how the men below all followed the same river along the same valley floor. And we saw them set up their campsites right in the path of the coming flash flood. But when the flood came, there was only room for two on the life raft. This is America. This episode of Before We Were White was written and produced by me, Brian Halpin, with theme music by Dave McLaughlin and Ray Cohen. The additional music by McTira. If you'd like to hear more podcasts, please consider supporting us at our Patreon page or at our website, beforewewerewhite.com. Thank you. <laughs>